Uh, Luke, we're going to start with the same verses because that we started with Sunday morning, but we're going to look at them in a different way. And there was in the con- uh, there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And again, we mention uh, from about Passover time in April until autumn, the flocks pastured constantly in the open fields. The shepherds lodging there all that time. So the shepherds lived uh, pretty much outside from April. Now, that's not what the months are called in Israel. But uh, from our April until um, autumn, which September 21st is uh, to us. So from uh, spring to autumn, basically shortly after spring to autumn, uh, or summer, all the way through summer. So quite a while they uh, were out in the field. That's where the the shepherds lived. And uh, the shepherds lodging there all the time. And then J.F.B., Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown said, "Uh, From this it seems plain that the period of the year usually assigned to our Lord's birth is too late. Uh, So Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary does not believe Jesus was born in December. Two comments on that. Number one, uh, again, it's a little further south than San Diego. I think there are a lot of days in San Diego you can run around short sleeves in uh, December. So I'm not convinced of uh, J.F., Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown's argument there uh, because it would be a tad warmer, not much, pretty close, but a tad warmer than San Diego. Now, so... To me, it's possible. On the other hand, it doesn't matter. Nobody knows the day that Jesus was born. We pick today to commemorate his birth. Nobody knows the day he resurrected. We know about when it was because uh, the Passover. And uh, so we're a little closer there. But at any rate, um, the shepherds were in the field watching the sheep. So, I put there, what do we learn about Christmas from J.F.B.'s notes? Uh, Jesus probably wasn't born in December. Again, Barb, next year, a year from now in December, let's go to San Diego. I want to see if you can sleep outside in San Diego in December. Uh, Pardon me? That's pretty Southern California, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I just don't see uh, why that's an issue, but then again... Um, I'm not the smartest guy on the block. Well, it depends on what block I'm on, I suppose. So, look at, um, again, I made that note. We don't know uh, the day of the year that Jesus was born. We simply picked one to celebrate that glorious event. Verse 9, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. So what does the glory of the Lord shown round about them mean? Well, the word glory is doxa. And again, from the Greek and Latin word doxa, we get the name of that shortest hymn I've ever seen in a hymn book, the doxology. And um, basically that's praising God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost in that hymn, the doxology. And so it means the doxa... Uh, means the glory of God. Uh, it could mean splendor or brightness. Shown round about means to shine around. And First um, John one five, John writes this: This then is the message we have heard of Him, of Jesus, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Uh, you know, we're going to go to a city where the Lamb is the light. People say, you know, it's amazing when you believe in God, things that seem to be a stickler to others don't bother you. For example, in the Genesis account, God doesn't create the sun and the moon until the fourth day. People say that can't work. Can't work at all. I don't see an issue. All it would have taken is God to say, Son, Jesus, come here. Stand right here. 
And He'd have provided the earth all the light that it needed. He's going to light it when He comes back. So that's not an issue to me at all. But nonetheless, uh, glory means the thunder of the brightness, or when it deals with God, the glory of God, uh, it means the who He is, in my uh, understanding of that word. When it says, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, it's not talking about we've fallen short of heaven. Heaven's not the glory of God. It's the who He is. All the spiritual, all, all of His attributes are His glory. Everything God is, He's light, He's truth, He's power. Everything God is, is the glory or the essence of who He is. We were created in His image, and because of sin, we've come short of that. And so what's God up to in your life? He's conforming you, in Romans 8, 29, to the image of His Son. We've fallen from that image, and so God set in motion, through His Son, a plan to restore His children back to the image we've come short of. All right? So, um, that's what God's up to in your life, and He will get it done. Listen carefully. God has never been up to anything in history that He didn't complete. There was nothing God ever started and didn't finish. So if God is on a journey to conform you to the image of His Son, guess what? He's going to do, do it. Those He foreknew, He called. In the next verse, verse 30 of uh, Romans 8, those He called, He justified. Those He justified, He glorified. He's going to get us back to where sin removed us from. All right. So, verse 10, The angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all, all people. Now, who's the angel speaking to in verse 10? Well, the obvious answer is he's speaking audibly to the shepherds. The shepherds are in the field. Nighttime, dark. And all of a sudden, somebody flips the switch. And it looks like daytime, brighter than the day. And the angels are filling the sky, multitude of the heavenly host. Not two or three. Can I tell you something? I don't want this to offend you. God doesn't mind showing off sometimes. He fills that sky with multitudes of angels. And as far as we know, nobody's seen them but the shepherds. That's not an issue with God. God can let it be dark for everyone else and light for the angels. Uh, I mean, for the shepherds. Uh, God is God. And again, He doesn't mind showing off. All right? In a good way. So, uh, He was speaking audibly to the shepherds. Who else was He speaking to? Were there other people traveling around that might have uh, overheard the conversation? Don't think so. At that time, He was speaking to a specific audience the angels. But, the angels are, in my mind, the only ones who heard the angel audibly. Okay? The only one who heard the angels audibly. Now, when I talk about that, Kevin Fleming, you know, uh, come Friday mornings and um, to high beat, and he really believes that there won't be a lot of talking in eternity. He believes well, you, um, telepathically. telepathically. He believes pe- uh, everyone will know what you're going to say. I uh, know what you're thinking. That there would just be like some sci-fi movies. You won't have to audibly speak it. It'll just uh, uh, I'll know what Jack's thinking, and it'll be okay because in heaven you'll always be thinking the right thing. <laughs> so uh, you're safe. But anyway, um, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, we read in the book of Revelation that people fall down and praise God, but does it necessarily mean the way we do it today? Uh, I don't know. We'll find out, though, and I'm excited to find the, the answer to those questions. So, he was speaking via the recording. They didn't have tape players. You know, if I didn't trust you, and I was going to meet with you about something, 
and I didn't know what you were going to do with my conversation, I could put record on here, hide it in my back pocket, and record our conversation. And then if you lied about my com- our conversation, I could get this out and play it to the cops. And I would have evidence as to what I said. They didn't have that in the shepherd's day. So when I say via the recording, he was talking, they were talking specifically to the shepherd, but beyond that they said, and to all people. So the message of God that the angels received was recorded, or the shepherds received, was recorded. Not by a tape recorder. They had no such instrument in that day. It was recorded by handwritten notes. In this case, not by the shepherds, but by Luke. Paul's beloved physician. Now, how Luke wasn't there, how could he record what was said? The same way everything else in Scripture is written. He received it by divine inspiration of Almighty God and wrote down exactly what was said to him by God. So uh, that's how the entire Bible is given by inspiration of God, the Bible teaches us. So um, Luke is the one who wrote this. He's the one who told us about the angels. As far as we know, the angels never wrote. They told people. We find that after they found the baby and left, they told everybody. And folk didn't know what to think about this. Which tells me nobody else seen the sky light up. If everybody had seen the sky light up, they'd think, ooh, these guys must know something. Isn't God amazing? Did I mention He doesn't mind showing off? All right. So anyway, um, He was speaking first of all to the shepherds because they were going to be eyewitnesses of this. But then beyond that, he said, Fear not, behold, I bring you, the shepherds, good tidings of great joy, but it's going to go beyond that, which shall be to all people. So, easy to read version down uh, below there. says, The angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I have some very good news for you. News that will make everyone happy. At least everyone who believes puts their faith in God. So, uh, who was this message uh, that the angel shared for? It was for everyone, everywhere who would hear the message via the gospel. That means the message of good tidings of great joy was for you and me. All right? Verse 11. He goes on. The angel, the spokesman angel, the angel who's doing the talking, tells the shepherds why they should cheer up because he's bringing good tidings of great joy. That's for everybody. Here's what the message is. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So who was born? Christ the Lord was born. Now, again, New Testament written in Greek. Uh, The Greek word for Christ is Christos. The Greek word for Lord is Kyrios. Boy, I wish more people were curious about the Lord, don't you? <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, here's what I found interesting. Luke's the only person who ever uses that phrase, Christ the Lord. I was really surprised at that. Um, so he said... Here is the good news. This person, the person being born in Bethlehem this day is Christ the Lord. Now, the other writers use Christ and they use Lord. But Luke's the one who put them together. Christ the Lord. So, here's what Sayers Greek Dictionary says. Christ was the Messiah, the Son of God, the Anointed One. Then he goes on. Lord is curious, he to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding, master or Lord. In other words, when we call Jesus Lord of our life, it means he owns us. He has lordship over our decisions. We're supposed to do our very best to make every one of our decisions be in line with his desires. He's the possessor and disposer of a thing. He's the owner. 
one who has control of the person, the master. In the state, he's the sovereign prince chief, the Roman emperor. It's a title of honor expressive of respect and reverence with which servants greet their master. The title is given to God, the Messiah. So, again, the question up there, who is Christ the Lord? Looking at their definitions there, I put down, He is the anointed one of Jehovah God. He is the very Son of God. Now again, this combination, Christ the Lord occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. And it's not clear what it really means. In other words, when He puts those two words, we know what the words mean. But uh, why are they arranged the way they are here and nowhere else in the New Testament? It's uh, really not clear. So... Uh, commentators think about it and wonder about it. Uh, Luke is very fond of curious. He likes to mention uh, uh, the word Lord a lot where the other Gospels have Jesus. So it may mean Christ the Lord. Christ is the Anointed One. So he could be saying the Anointed One is the Lord Jesus. Um, Anointed Lord, Messiah Lord, the Messiah the Lord, an Anointed One, a Lord our Lord Messiah. It occurs once in the Septuagint in Lamentation 4.20 and in Psalm, uh, uh, Song of Psalm in 17.36. So uh, the Septuagint again, I use that word a lot. Anybody remember what the Septuagint is? Now the New Testament was written in Greek, right? What was the Old Testament written in? What language? Pardon me? Hebrew. Hebrew. It's because that's the language of the Jew. So, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but Alexander the Great comes along, conquers the whole then known world, and wants his soldiers to be able to communicate to everybody. So, he passes a law that everybody has to learn a simple form of Greek so his soldiers can communicate to him. So the Roman Empire overthrows the Grecian Empire and they're smart enough not to reinvent the wheel. Their soldiers already have a way to communicate to everybody simple Greek. So God Almighty thought we didn't think, He did. I never thought of that before. God doesn't think, He does. I mean, He doesn't ponder. Using the word think like, huh. God... God has never done this. Huh. Oh. And never once. We might he that. does. God does what He's always known for an eternity past He would do. That's what God does. So, I do that a lot, huh? <laughs> so God said, Boy, I wish I knew I was going with that. You remember? Right before I got into God doesn't think the way we think. Yeah, we can what, Oh, the Septuagint. So, when God inspired the writing of the New Testament, He wanted it in the language that everybody who read anywhere in the realm, uh, the kingdom, could read. So, that's why the New Testament is written Greek. Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek. The Septuagint is a Greek rewrite of the Old Testament. So initially the Old Testament was written in the language of the Jews, but then as time passed and everybody was speaking, all the learned were speaking in Greek and uh, able to read Greek, they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And that's called the Septuagint. So, um, uh, you know, that might not interest a lot of you, but it's the whole idea... God was in Alexander the Great conquering the whole then old world. The gospel message was down the road. And God wanted to make sure everybody could understand it. He confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. He uses an ungodly general to bring the languages together by forcing everyone to learn some simple form of Greek so they could be communicated to. And so any learned person anywhere could read the writings of the apostles. Isn't that good? You know, I don't know. It just come to me. 
God might be smart. I think he's pretty clever. All right. So he is an anointed one of God. Let's flip that page over. Who was the Savior Christ the Lord born for? He was born for everyone included in the phrase unto you in verse 11, which people were called all people in verse 10. This Savior Christ the Lord was born unto every one of you, and he was born unto me. And again, page, uh, verses 10 and 11 are on this side. The angel said, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. All right, and then verse 11, for unto you, unto who? The all people, unto you, the shepherds, and then everybody else is written for. All people, for unto you, born this day in the city of David, a Savior. So, um, this Jesus was born for mankind. Everyone who would ever hear of Him. Now, when we get into discuss, doctrinal discussions with people who have a different take on Scripture, not not a bad take. There are some of the... Some of my favorite radio preachers believe in divine election. Uh, it's not an evil doctrine. I just disagree with it. And so when you, you sit down and you have discussions on these things, you don't always come to the same conclusion. But one of my reasons why I don't believe in divine election, divine election teaches that God has predestined before the beginning of this world the people who would be saved. Which means all the other people He didn't predetermine to be saved were created to go to hell. What else can you conclude? If He created right now how many billion? Six? Seven billion people on the planet. If He only created one billion to go to heaven... That means he created six billion to go to hell. The fallacy of the divine election crowd is this, and they won't embrace this. This is the fallacy they have. Their preachers say, you are saved because of what God did. Your neighbor is lost because of what he did. Simply not true. Not by that doctrine. By that doctrine, my neighbor is lost because God did not extend irresistible grace to him. If the only thing that can save us is irresistible grace that we cannot say no to if we've been predetermined by God to be saved, we have no way to say no to God's predetermined will. So the only way me and my neighbor were lost, I'm no longer lost because he poured irresistible grace on me. That's his choosing, not mine. Well, that's the way it was worded. I'm saved by God's choice. My neighbor is lost by his. That's not true. The God who chose to save me chose not to save my neighbor. Now, why am I getting at this? There's got to be something wrapped up where we see a fairness about God. If there's 7 billion people on the planet right now and God only planned from an eternity to pass to take a billion of them to heaven, hell's going to be crowded. And none of it, by that doctrine, none of it's to blame for the folk. They were no different than me, hopelessly lost. God shed on me the only thing that could save me, irresistible grace, and didn't shed it on those 6 billion people. So fairness... I believe in a just God. So to think that God would create six billion people with no opportunity of salvation is beyond my imagination. But having said that, there is no simple answer to any doctrine. All people, this was good news to, what all people? All people who would hear the gospel. There's a lot of people who have died since Jesus who never once heard the gospel. Never once. There are a lot of people on the planet today, this is hard to believe today with all the information out there, 
But there are a lot of people who, there are countries, evil countries that control the internet and won't let their people find anything they don't want them to have. There are a lot of people on the planet today and in jungles who have never heard the gospel message. So we still have the problem, how can they be saved if they've never heard and how will they hear unless uh, I send a preacher, God said. So we still have the fallacy did God create some people to live forever knowing that they would never hear the gospel? So there's a dilemma either way we go with this. Because this good news is for everybody. And so I wonder, and again, I've shared this with you before, this is not a steadfast doctrine of mine. I'm gonna, I do things that God will never do. Hmm. Yeah, huh. I wonder. God will never wonder. If God wondered, He'd wonder what are you doing creating me. I'll tell you that right now. But you and I see things that are beyond us sometimes, and we stop and go, huh. Oh, how can that be? If God, as we shared in Peter, and we'll be going back to Peter in uh, January. If he preached to the people in the flood at the time of the floods, Jesus, talking Jesus, he wasn't born yet, but Peter was saying, evidently, in the three days Jesus was dead, he went and preached to those who disobeyed him Noah's day. Why? I contend. I can prove, I contend that I can prove. Obviously, my proof would not be sufficient for some. But I believe that God allowed no one in heaven before Jesus rose from the dead because their sins hadn't been forgiven yet. Might have been covered, but not forgiven. And so I believe Jesus went down into Abraham's bosom and preached the gospel in those three days he was dead. So it looks like he was an evangelist for three days. He preached to Noah's crowd. The people who didn't listen to Noah's day. And he preached to the righteous dead who had put their faith in God best they knew how before Jesus. And of course, everybody in Abraham's bosom in paradise embraced Jesus and went to heaven with him. How about the people in Noah's day. I don't know how spread out they were yet, but there were probably people who never heard of Noah who died in that flood. They died without any kind of warning. The people that knew Noah had been warned by Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and they rejected. So the hmm that I have is if Jesus went and preached to people already dead. Well, he was dead, physically dead, because they hadn't heard. Is it possible that he still does that to multitudes who have never heard the word Jesus, who have died throughout the last two millennia? last 2,000 years. Is it possible Jesus has made trips to make sure that everyone has an opportunity? I don't know, but I wonder. Because I believe in an absolutely fair God. And this I feel I do know. I do know that he went to preach to some people that were from Noah's day. Peter told us. And I do believe the only way Abraham's bosom or paradise was emptied is for him to descend into that and preach the gospel to those who live by Old Testament faith who readily received it and went to heaven with them. I believe those, in my mind, those two things are absolutes. One, because it says so about uh, the Noah crowd. And the other, because it's apparent that in Matthew 27... After Jesus arose, many of the Old Testament saints, many of the saints arose. 
uh, and was seen in the city. So I, I think both of those in my mind. And uh, so if that's the case, if Jesus likes to wander around in another world preaching, who knows what He's done over the years? Who knows? I don't, but I wonder. But I do believe when I get to heaven, I am going to be overwhelmed at the fairness of God. The justice of God. I believe that. I, I won't say, God, how could you not give them an opportunity? I don't think there'll be any of that. I think my eyes will be opened and I'll be overwhelmed with how fair God is. So that's just some food for thought. So, Micah 5 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet, um, this is a prophecy about Jesus, yet out of thee. Uh, shall he come forth uh, unto me, that is, to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So it has been prophesied in the Old Testament that the coming Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David, and that's exactly what the angels told the shepherds, where they could find him. Um, Isaiah fourteen twelve to 15 How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet, God said in in answer to the devil who said, that's what I'm going to do. Here was God's response. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. I don't have much time, but just let me say this real quick. There's a Lucifer principle and the Jesus principle. The Lucifer principle is, I'm not God, but I will be. I will ascend above the throne of God. I will be like the Most High. What? That was the lie that defeated him. What did he tell Eve? The Lucifer lie. God knows if you eat of this tree, you will be like Him, knowing good from evil. That's the Lucifer principle. Here's the Jesus principle. The Jesus principle who, who being in very form like God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But, even though he was God, even though he had equality with God, he chose to humble himself and come down here and save me. Satan wasn't God. He wanted to be God. Jesus was God. He didn't cling to it. He came and humbled himself and saved us. All right? Philippians 2. That's the area I just quoted from. He he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, I just wanted you, you, I'll take those notes with you and pray over them and and study those final verses. I just want you to know this. There's never been a moment in history, not our history, God's history. There has never been a moment. God's history is eternal, backward and forward. There has never been a moment when you weren't on His mind. Not a single moment. Sometimes we go through trials and think, God, do you even remember my address? There has never been a moment when you haven't crossed His mind.